Well, hello, everybody. This is Matt Dabbs at discipleship.org, and I'm pleased to have uh, Renee Sproles on the program for talking about discipling women. And a little bit about Renee very quickly is that she is a speaker and an author, and she has written a book on gender as well as a couple of other books um, with uh, Renew. And uh, she also is the director of cultural engagement at Renew. And so she has a lot of experience in discipling women. I'm really looking forward to hearing from her experience and insight on uh, discipling women and how we can just do a, a great job at doing that. So uh, welcome, Renee. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk. Well, absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, your experience in this area. Yeah. So uh, when I think about discipling, I just think back to my childhood. So I had kind of a unique situation. My parents' home on either side was flanked by aunts and uncles. And behind us across the cow pasture was my grandparents. And so I, you know, discipleship was not a word we used in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up. But that's exactly what happened in that um, location for me. I could just pop across the pasture to my grandmother's house. And I did quite frequently. And I would just hang out with her. And she might be back on the bed reading her Bible in the afternoon or in the kitchen, cooking lunch or dinner, pop over to play with my cousins at my aunts and uncles' houses. And so, yeah, I just watched how to do life with them. Then my husband and I, we met in college at Harding University, married in college at age 21. So we've been married quite a while. I guess it's 31 years now. We have two adult children who are married, two granddaughters. And so we're in that next generation of discipleship with them. I would say in those that season of um, full nesting, not empty nesting, I guess, homeschooling really taught me about what discipleship is. And so I've had some experience in that realm with discipleship. And my husband and I took and then taught parenting classes. And the, the whole time we were raising our kids, not because we thought we knew what we were doing, but because we just wanted to have that accountability that uh, mm. that teaching brought us. And there was nobody older who was willing to teach. And so we would just go home, do this stuff with our family, come back and go, here's how it went. But as that season came to an end, we began to see young couples that we thought, wow, there's so much potential there, but they just need a boost. And that took us into another realm of discipleship, which is where we are now. We work with, you know, young families a lot, be with the husbands and and I with the wives. And so that's kind of where I am these days. Okay. So one of the things that we really appreciate is that you're a practitioner. This is not just theory, but you're in people's lives. It's relational. And so when you, when you speak about it, it's from that real practical, real life experience with people. Yeah. So yeah, I, I always, I was talking to a dear friend of mine, who's a PhD theologian. And I was like, I, I feel out of my depth sometimes. And he goes, Renee, you have a PhD in life. And so, well, so that's comforting to me that I do have some experiences that I hope maybe will bless some people and they can see, hey, I can do this too. You don't have to go to school to learn to do it. Absolutely. You know, I ask people sometimes, have you ever been intentionally discipled by somebody or like even like a class or you got speaking somewhere, like ask like a room full of people and depending on the setting, but if it's a Bible class in a church and like maybe like out of 50 people, like 10 people raise their hand, three people, two people. Okay, who did it, you know? And they almost always say, mom, you know? <laughs> or maybe they'll say a Bible class teacher. And then I'm kind of, and it's like, that's not exactly Bible class teacher, Sunday morning, one hour a week in a class, not really what I'm talking about. But the mom thing is legit, you know? Like, yeah, mom probably did disciple you. So what have you found that that has been effective with discipling women and some of the things that we need to know that maybe might be different when we think in terms of, on the guy's side and the men doing it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So listen, we are all really busy. Everybody nice. be really busy. And so I was like, how can I carve out space for these women, these high potential women that I think really need someone to speak into their lives? What we saw, just as an aside real quick, that our co-teachers and I in that parenting class was as we taught through the years, more and more and more young families did not have a mom or a dad. They felt like they could go and ask mm -hmm. how to do life or who showed them well how to do life. And when it reached that temp tipping point of over half of them not having that kind of relationship, I thought, okay, well, the church is the body of Christ. And 
you know, Paul writes, you know, we're the, we're the mothers and the fathers and the brothers and the sisters. And so it's time mm. for me to, now that my children are grown, it's time for me to invest in some other daughters, mm. husband to invest in some other sons. So we looked for people that we were interacting with who, who had the qualities of faithfulness. So when they said they were going to do something, they generally did. Um, they were they were available. They had time. You know, I've had people, women, ask me to meet with them and and help them be a better wife or mom. And I'm like, okay, I'm available next week these times. And we we end up booking six weeks out mm. because that's the first available time that they have. And so, mm. uh, you know, I will meet with someone once in that scenario, but that's not really someone I'm going to be able to disciple because they're just not available. And then reliable is another quality I'm looking for. Again, they're just going to show up on time generally. I mean, you know, life happens, but are they characterized seven or eight times out of 10, you know, showing up on time, that kind of thing. And then teachable. That was what we really focused on with our children is having a teachable heart. You want a heart that's responsive to correction, to the truth, to God's word. So when I began to see these women, I thought, okay, well, let's do life together. And so I was scared. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I did it with my old kids, but it's different, you know, and you're building relational capital where with your own family, you have relational capital. So I invited a friend, a, a girlfriend about my age, and I said, hey, will you hold my hand and come do it with me? And that was great. We did it for a year together. Renew had some great materials just for like how to start a discipleship group. And like right off the bat, we, um, my, uh, my friend Bonnie and I, who um, who's my co-host for Just Ask Your Mom podcast, because we started the podcast because we, we fought, saw all these women who couldn't ask their mom. So that's a really fun thing in this season of mm -hmm. life. Too. But she and I modeled our testimonies, just 30 minute little summary of five God moments in our lives. And then we asked the other women to come prepared to do that in the weeks that followed. And that's like the equivalent of six months of relationship. When you do that, it's just like a fast forward button. And then we were able to just get to know them well enough to go, okay, hey, what are you needing in your life right now? And so we did, um, we did, like the boundaries book was one of the things we did. They're like, we need to learn boundaries in our lives. So that was like one of the first things we did. We've done Bible, straight up Bible studies, those kinds of things. But getting started, I just, I just started to notice, I guess, to summarize the people in my life who had the qualities I thought would, would lend themselves to being good candidates for discipleship. And then I started that group. But then I began to see like, that's not enough that we needed to do life together as well. So I began to look for opportunities to play together. So they had lots of small children. So we would go do play dates just on a playground, maybe the church playground that's fenced in. So you can have kind of a conversation and half and one eye on your kid and one eye on the conversation. My husband and I began hosting um, dinners one night a month that were intentionally like lavish, date night kind of dinners for them where they got a sitter and then we would have this these really nice meals and then we would pray like hey how's life really going so combine something that we were already doing which is having people over for dinner with an intentional component of you're going to come responsible to say like what's really going on and not like with your aunt like with your yourself <laughs> in your marriage like we care about your aunt too but so those are kind of the things that started us probably I don't know, five years ago in this season of disciples, really intentional discipleship with um, young couples in their 30s. That's great. So a couple of things as you were talking, one of them was you reminded me and we talked about the family language of the New Testament. You know, we often will talk about how like the word disciple is used almost 300 times. But what sometimes gets missed in that is that it's only really used in the Gospels and Acts. And then all of a sudden it just drops out pretty much 100%. I don't know if it's ever used after Acts that I can think of, but like you go to Bible Gateway and search for disciple, you're not, you don't see it, you know, a little count number there on the side where what books it sends. So, but it changed, the, the language changes and it's now it's brothers and sisters, the household of God, the family of God, 
younger and older, you know, you go into the pastorals and all that instruction is very family, energy, all of that. Like I hear that and what you're talking about. Absolutely. And the, <laughs> I've been pondering this because when you've been married this long, you see a lot of people start to get divorced. So mm. a lot of people in our season of life are friends that we've had for a long time or their marriages are falling apart. And um, my friend Bonnie and I were pondering this just yesterday. And we said, there's something about the covenant of marriage. When, like when you enter a covenant, what you're saying is, I refuse to walk away. Mm. I'm going to stay. And that applies to the body of Christ too, right? Because Christ makes a covenant with his church. And so the weak members, the annoying members, the members who are not as strong as you'd like them to see, what we're saying to one another is we stay, we stay, we're not walking away. And so even with my attempt to find faithful, available, teachable, reliable women, I have a, there's a variety if we get to know each other. And there are some who are weaker than others. There's some who I wish were more mature. There's some who I wish displayed more discipline. But the thing about discipleship is for at least a season, you're, you're saying like, I'm doing life with you and I'm not walking away. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, there's growth for me when I deal with every kind of person, not just the superstars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that's how I'm becoming Christ to them because Christ doesn't deal with just superstars. Christ, yeah. Christ came for everyone. And so that's a, just another facet of the love of Christ that was eye-opening for me um, mm. in this journey. Sometimes people will say like church attendance is like a spiritual discipline. It's like the discipline of saying, I'm going to show up. I may not like the song. I may not like the message that morning. I made my kids made me cranky, whatever, but like, we're going to be with our people, you know, and then, and then the tough ones are going to say stuff or the person I didn't want to see or whatever. Like, this is all part of the family. Like, this is, you know, we all have that crazy aunt or uncle at the family reunion that it's like, oh, there's aunt Sally, you know, just oh, stay away. what you going to say it's, you know, I, I it. politics or something, <laughs> you know, so that's a, it's a discipline. It helps us grow, you know, and, and I, I, when I hear you talk about the four things, the faithfulness and reliability and availableness, teachableness. You know, it makes me think about the good soil and the power of parable of the sower. You know, it's like, what, what are the characteristics of good, receptive soil when that seed falls down? Like people who are going to receive it well. And, you know, there's, I'm, it, you're just kind of saying there's varying levels of each of those four things with people, you know, and some have different challenges, but. And they fall in and out. Like there's seasons of mm -hmm. life where someone might become a little less reliable. Well, if you dig a little, you know, and if you pray and ask God for uh, wisdom and understanding, which he promises when we ask. Right. So that's a guaranteed yes. Um, usually you'll see like there's something under the surface there that needs to be dealt with. And so that's when you start, you take it to the next level and you go, you call them up and go, hey, can we have lunch or can, can you go over for a cup of coffee? Um, mm -hmm. I'm concerned about you. And the next level that makes your heart so happy is when your other group members start to do it and they, they start checking on one another. And, and yeah, like got to bear with one another. Yes, that's Paul said, bear with one another and, and love, bear each other's burdens, all those good one another passages. And so we have such an isolated, individualized society. Even in our churches, there's a lot of isolation amongst, you know, the big group of people. So when you, when, what is it about someone or when you, when you run into somebody new who ends up being someone that you are in this relational discipleship with, you're looking for these four things, but you don't know that right away. So like, what is that initial contact? Or how do you know this is somebody that you want to invite in? I would say they have this eager puppy energy about them. <laughs> that when I'm interacting with them, they're just like soaking it up. And they seem so eager to um, know more, learn, learn more. There's an enthusiasm. Even if they're kind of a laid back person, you know, you can sense a hunger um, in them. And so that's what I'm seeing. I'm, and I'm seeing... When I see that little spark, that little, you know how puppies are. They're just so excited about everything. You know, when I see that, I'm like, okay, that's somebody who's going to make space. That's, it. that's because one of the things I try to teach moms and dads and my husband tries to teach the husbands is that you're the boss. Like you're in control here. You, you have a lot more volition than you think you do over your family's rhythm. So you put everything in your life on the table. And you ask God to show you what you need to just swipe right off 
to make space for what's super important in your lives. I learned that from my years of working for a church. Families in crisis come, you know, to the senior pastor and they're like, help, help, our marriage is in trouble. And you, you know, the pastor will meet with them for two or three visits and then he'll say, okay, it's time for you to actually dig in. Let's get you to a counselor. Let's get you in, in the prayer ministry. And they'd be like, well, we really can't afford that. And, and their kids are in um, private golf instruction and travel mm. softball. And I'm like, you're not willing to count the cost. Like you, you have the funds and the only thing your children want is an intact family. And you're saying no. You, you, think you, you think you don't have a choice, but you have a choice. And so reminding parents that they have a choice, like they, like they, they take the hits. It's scary making hard decisions, but that's what we do. We, we, we are filled with the Spirit of God, and we have the capability to ask for wisdom and understanding and structure our lives in ways that are going to move us in the direction we want to mm. go. So, you know, I just am like, sports are not a default. yes. You know, all the extracurriculars are not a default. Yes, they're not evil. It's just, what are you saying no to when you say yes to this, all this time and this financial commitment? And I, I'm just, I struggled with it as a young mom. Uh, I struggled with, what do we say yes to? I thought I was ruining my kids' futures if we didn't do, you know, soccer or t-ball or something, you know, and just counting the cost of the time that it was going to take. And, and yeah, finally, you know, that wisdom that I was looking for, God just kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, no, they're going to be fine. This is an American value. And that's why you're struggling with it. The, the, the view of a well-rounded child or a well-rounded life, I don't see that language in scripture. I see, I see growing up into maturity and the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things. Um, yeah. or at least they're two different paths, America's way to, to well-roundedness and, and God's way. Yes. Well, everyone is being discipled all the time. You can be discipled by the world and secular discipleship on a constant daily basis, or you can be discipled by the Jesus people, you know, the, the Jesus way, but we're all being discipled every day. And so, you know, it sounds like these people have a a, a preferred vision of their future that involves very American, you know, whatever the word criteria or, or experiences for their kids and all this very Americana, you know, it's like, but your marriage is about to fall through the floor. Then what are they going to have? It's like somehow they, why do you think they can't see that? Or like, what, what's the difficulty for people that, that there is that just so thoroughly discipled by the world that they can't even see that? Yeah, I guess I guess maybe that it's that's part of it. I do think I think we hold some things off as non-negotiables, you know. Um, and so that's why I say, you know, just put it on the table. What would your life look like if you said no to this and yes to this? I, you know, yeah. it it's it's there's a there's good and better and best. And so again, like sports teach lots of great qualities of discipline and teamwork and things that are values and walking with Jesus. It's just, is it, is it best for your family? And I've met some, some moms, we've interviewed some moms on our podcast who did do that. Serious sports and integrated serious intentional discipleship. It can be done, but it's not a given. She and her husband had to really focus on, okay, how are we going to use this time? that we've devoted to this and we discipleship into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that, that couple that you were saying said, we can't afford marriage counseling, but they're doing all these things like that. It's, it's amazing that the marriage would be the negotiable. Yeah. Yeah. And that marriage didn't stay intact. I mean, uh, which is no surprise. And, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm not picking on them. That's just one example of many. Sure. Again, where, where we have been discipled by the, by the world to think these are non-negotiables and then here's my negotiables. And, you know, God turns that upside down when you come to Christ, you know, the foolishness, the foolish things of the world, shame the wise <laughs> in yeah, God's honor. Yeah. So. 
Do you have any, I really like hearing God stories, like the kind of stories where you're like, only God could do that. We didn't do that. Like he used us, but that was all him. Like, do you have any stories like that? And you're just dis discipling? Oh yeah, I'm sure I have so many. Let's think about this. Well, yeah, I would say that in my discipleship group of, of the five women who are now just dear friends, I'm like, you're with me for life. You know, I may have another discipleship group of women, but you're, we're, you're never going away. If I could just go around the circle with them. One of the husbands who had been a, a Christ follower, but he, I don't know. I think he felt like he was okay with God. God and I are okay. I'm a good guy. Through discipleship with my husband was like, you know what? I really think I need to submit to God in baptism. He'd never been baptized. And so all the guys in the discipleship group, you know, get down in the baptistry with him and baptize him. His wife has, has learned so many times to hold her tongue. That's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. Hmm. When she, and she's real, real relational people, real people who are really good at, at being friends have a hard time forgiving. Um, I know because I raised a daughter mm -hmm. like that. Super, super intuitive in relationships, you mm. know, and and so she would have a hard time, you know, letting stuff go. This mom was that way. To watch her hold her tongue and to watch her forgive her husband when he says something harsh to her. That to me, that's like that's not raise the dead kind of a miracle, but like that that's the that's spirit huge. of God inside of her. I've seen husbands and wives fight in prayer, go to like next level in prayer submit to freedom prayer sessions, deliverance prayer sessions for themselves and their children. I've seen adopted children, you know, get freedom from the generational baggage they've brought. I've seen families, a husband and wife who came from terrible examples, terrible examples. I'm, I mean, I, I'm appalled at where people come from. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. at how we yeah. fail each other, you know, as as parents and children. I've seen them. I've seen the husband's heart turn in gentleness to his wife and him learn to hold his tongue. And I've seen the wife learn to find her strengths and um, confidence in the Lord to run a home, to raise four children, to be the wife he needs to be. Yeah, I mean, God God has come to some of my, my women in dreams and visions. I, I mean, we're, we're talking like that yeah. stuff gets me so, so excited. And it's a, you know, it's a word of knowledge for dealing with one of their children or a way forward with a problem in their marriage. And I just get to tag along. I guess I get to cheer them on. That's what I call myself. I'm like lead cheerleader. My, my job is to intercede in prayer. My job is to give them a little bit of teaching, but I got to say, I've said it before, an ounce of obedience is worth a pound of theology. We are not brains on sticks here. So discipleship is really just giving them that nugget of truth and then challenging them to go live it and then cheering them on as they do the hard work of obedience. And so, yeah, I've seen so many beautiful, beautiful stories in these in these families. And I feel confident that they're moving into the future so much stronger than they would have been had they just been doing the church programs. Yeah. Well, and discipleship is such a key part in our participation. You know, those are God's stories. God did this, but you know, you all also participated in that. You offered the prayers, you try to be obedient to God, you encourage through biblical instruction. You know, it's like discipleship is happening. You're watching God move. And I, I think those two things like really coincide. So like all through scripture, you just see like, like the book of Judges. It's like they turn their heart away from God and, the, you know, the, the, the bad guys come and do all this stuff. And then they're like, oh, what was us? You know, we got to get back to God and be holy and do the right thing and try to obey him and try to follow him and all this. And it's like, okay, okay, you're finally ready for me to help you, you know, now watch me work. And sometimes God moves first. Sometimes, I mean, like, you know, in other nations, we hear these Jesus dreams in various countries where, you know, Jesus comes to people in dreams and they go search out a Christian and, you know, be converted and things like that. Sometimes God initiates it, but those people I, I bet are open, you know, that he's, I don't, I don't know how all that works. I don't even want to begin there, but 
you know, I, I think that there's a really important partnership there that discipleship is maybe the word for where, yeah, God's doing the heavy lifting, but man, we're seeking him. We're trying to live, do what he said. And one of the things I love about Discovery Bible Study is that I will, it's like, when you review the I will the next week, it's like, it's not heavy accountability. I don't think it's, hey, guess what? I did what Jesus said, and you won't believe what happened with my neighbor. You won't believe the da, da, da. And you start talking like, God did this, this, this. You're like, wow. Like when you live the word, God shows up big. It's just amazing. Yes, it's that probably what I've grown in the most and trying to just disciple women is prayer. And it's it's when I think sometimes if somebody's listening to this and thinking like, wow, like she sounds like an expert, like A, I'm not. And B, I'm just a willing vessel. But I will say that one of the best things I've learned in the last probably two years is when I am in relationship with these women and we come up against a, a problem, you know, in their marriage, oh, my husband's doing this, just immediately go to go in prayer. Hey, let's ask Jesus what he thinks about this. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll just say, okay, Jesus, here, you know her heart. She's hurting. Can you show her the heart of her husband in this? Why did he do that? And we just sit. Mm -hmm. and we listen and we wait and I'm telling you I've never had Jesus not show up for one of my women and he can give them I mean I know in my gut what the answer is he can give them them the most clear answer and then we'll just move forward she'll give me that answer that Jesus gave her and we'll go okay now what would you like her next move to be how can Mm -hmm. she how can she move into this relationship in a way that honors you and that you know, um, respects her husband and sit. Yeah. So one of the things that I've learned in the last probably two years also is that if I feel like, if I believe in, deep in my heart that God provided, that God interceded, that God intervened, like that God did that. Like you look at something like God did that. So like I prayed for wisdom and then these things started happening and people started saying things in the Bible. I'm looking at the scriptures. It's like, you know, the Holy Spirit lays something on your heart that maybe, maybe a way of doing it comes to mind that you just would have never done. You're like, I would have never done that. And then like maybe two or three people say the same thing as what's weighing on you. Like you see this like cohesion of spiritual that God forces and the word and everything. And then you move forward and you're like, I would have never done that. But look at what happened when I went forward, forward with that. My, my point is, is that I feel a greater conviction when I feel like God's in it, you know, like to move forward, to be obedient, to like, and I always try to be obedient, but then when it just feels like I'm just thinking of stuff or I just asked a friend and like, well, you could this, you know, it's like, that just doesn't have a great level of conviction, you know, for me, as opposed to like, when you really watch God work and then you feel like I need to really be obedient to this because he just did all that. Like I asked and he did X, Y, and Z. And it's like, how would I not follow up like how would i not follow along with what i see him doing he's in this you know absolutely learning to hear the voice of god on your own is is so critical so you know you, i always say like you got to have scripture got to give the holy spirit something to work with so that's kind of you know the instructional part and then once you've given you know the holy spirit something to work with you need to trust that he's going to be able to bring that right back up whenever you need it and as a discipleship leader I can, I can do that. I can maybe remind them of a scripture, mm-hmm. but still it's, it's just so much better when God does it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So, and so I just, I love that technique. I wish I'd known it five years ago, but it's been a blessing to me and it, and I've seen it work so well in my women's lives. Yeah. There was a verse I read right past for so many years. I was more of a cessationist kind of growing up. Like, I don't really think the Holy Spirit does an awful lot. And then if I thought the Holy Spirit might have done something, I was like, oh, that's kind of scary. I hope that's not it, you know? And I, I so regret that that was the way for like 25 years or so of my life. And yeah, we oh, don't goodness. want to touch the car and not use the gas, right? We, there we go. Yeah. We yeah. want to, we want to drive the car with gas. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, the, the verse is Acts 16. I read right over it for a long time. So it says that the Holy Spirit, or it says God, but I think it's the Holy Spirit. I guess I think it's how God operates there, but that's just God. He can do whatever he wants. It says the Holy Spirit, God opened her heart to Paul's message. I keep wanting to say the Holy Spirit, but I think it says God. And so it changes the way you pray about the people you disciple, because here I'm trying to help them. 
And then I'm like, wait a minute, God can do anything. Like he literally can give them a dream that says, here's exactly what you're supposed to do next. Here's exactly what you're supposed to say. And so I'm like, that changes the way I pray for people. Yeah. Now I'm like, okay, God, you send whoever you want to tell them. You tell them. Show, yeah. Get them to a, a verse that tells them. When they open their Bible, whatever it is, just do it, you know, and, and he'll do it. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Well, tell us a little bit about if there was a word for church leaders, maybe some things that would be helpful to, to consider in, in promoting disciple-making culture. What do yeah. they need to know? I, you and I talked about this question ahead of time, and I was thinking, you know, I, I take everything back to parenting. It's just what I, what I did, parenting and homeschooling <laughs> for, for 15 years. And, and so in our home, I noticed that we got more of what we celebrated. Mm. And in discipline with my children, I, I kind of, I wanted this like five to one, even 10 to one, positive to negative. So, you know, I wanted to be pointing out what I wanted. So if they're lying, you know, three years old about, you know, lots of kids developmentally go through the lying phase. Well, yeah, we might, we'll punish for lying. We don't want to let that slide. But what I really want to do is cheer for the truth. So every time my child would tell me the truth, hey, that was the truth. I'm so glad you told me the truth. God loves the truth. And, and so churches, you know, can operate the same way. I mean, we're families, right? So if church leaders are constantly celebrating, you know, these wins in discipleship, I feel like you're going to get more of what you celebrate. People are going to go, oh, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. It's so much, it's so much fun to hear stories. We're wired for story. Jesus taught in story. Yes. Yes. The testimonies are super powerful. If you have a ton of programs that are not really intentionally disciple making, you're you're kind of you're making them choose. Mm. You're making them choose. They only have so much time in a week. And so making space and making those hard decisions, I would say it to a church just like I'd say it to one of my moms. What you're saying yes to means you're saying no to something else. So taking a hard look and asking for God's wisdom about, hey, what's working and getting us the results we want and what can we, it's good, but there's maybe something better that we could let go. Like, so maybe those two things is what I would say. There's a phrase in uh, child psychology called the, uh, uh, the positive opposite. And so instead of just criticizing or, or punishing, which is important also to punish an appropriate behavior, appropriate punishment, uh, you know, is to praise the positive opposite. So now you're like exactly what you said. It's yes. It's so much more fun, <laughs> but, you know, for the, for the parent and for the child. And so for the church leaders and for the church, it's so fun to celebrate all the wins. Well, it communicates more effectively if you say, if, when you celebrate the win, because when you, when, you, when you punish something or criticize something, all you're getting is this is what you're not supposed to do. Okay, well, that leaves me a million options of what I'm, I am supposed to do, but maybe some of those are wrong. So when you, when, you, when you celebrate the win like that in front of the church or through testimony or just a testimony followed up by someone coming up and talking about why, why specifically that story needed to be heard, you know, that's like, can you, do you hear how they listen to the voice of God? Did you hear how they like start labeling those things? And do you think that could help create a culture? Yeah. And my husband and I do it. We teach a Sunday morning class. We'll yeah. do it in our class. So, you know, we'll give a teaching and then the next week they'll, we'll come, we'll, they'll come back and we'll go, okay, how'd it go? Tell us what it looked like. Did you do mm -hmm. it? You know, even a challenge to have the discipline of daily Bible reading. We'll say like, you know, we're doing Ephesians. You can read Ephesians one every day this week and we're going to, you know, study it on Sunday, or you can listen to it on audio, or you can do it this way or that way. And then we have people come back and say, hey, here's how it went. And, and we're cheering each other on. And it's very encouraging, very encouraging for the class and for us as leaders. Well, you're not just, you know, tossing seed into the wind. And <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, do you have any, any nuggets or insights for us as we kind of wrap up? Any final words? I thought I was just pondering, you know, in our busy modern American culture, if I were just going to say one thing to someone to encourage them to try discipleship, I would say, ask, look at your life, look at the rhythm of your week, 
and ask God where you can have someone come along. The Deuteronomy 6 model, you know, come as you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, you know, discipleship is life. And the more life we can do with one another, the better. Maybe you do have some things you need to slide off, but maybe there's some things on your table that are actually really good and working and you just need to bring some people along. We love to entertain. That was like one of the first entry points was turning entertaining, having people over for dinner to an opportunity to sit around the table and really say what's going on and pray for each other. Mm. That was an easy yes. That might not be your easy yes, but um, just the coming along the way. God will show you that's something he wants you to do. Mm. And the more life we can do together, the better. So good. Well, thank you for sharing your insights, Renee. It's always a pleasure talking with you, and I appreciate what God has done in your ministry and continues to do. You really are very inspiring, and I really appreciate you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I love talking about this stuff. And let's not forget the forum's coming up. You're speaking at the forum in May. Yep, I am. I don't know what I'm speaking on yet, but I will. You always do a great job. So thank you. Y'all uh, check out the forum uh, landing page. We'll put a link to that. Uh, with uh, with this content so that you can find that and register for that. But uh, you'll take care. Thanks.